Good evening. It's good to see you again and grateful for our opportunity to be back together and worshiping God and <clears throat> this opportunity to now study a while together once more from His Word. I am very grateful for the invitation the elders have extended to allow me to be with you today and I, I appreciate everybody's interest as well. I got to meet with the elders this afternoon, the deacons as well, and and I uh, want to uh, let you know if you have any particular questions about uh, the work in India, something that I could uh, uh, address with you, I'd be happy to receive those questions, or something that we teach here uh, from uh, this stand. We'd be happy to receive those questions. We uh, understand that when we teach publicly, we are uh, welcoming uh, public uh, uh, critique, and uh, we hope that... Uh, uh, if we receive those critiques in a way, we pr pray that we'll receive them in a way that, that will uh, help us to grow and mature and understand and teach God's Word uh, even as accurately as possible to His praise and to His honor. If you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, we want to encourage you to understand that the most important decision that you can make is yet ahead of you, and we pray that tonight would be the time that you would make that decision that you would respond to God's call, God's invitation to be saved in His Son, Jesus Christ. We urge you at the end of this study to, to uh, come forward and let us know that you believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. If you're convicted of your sin against Him, then be willing to uh, make that confession of faith and repent of your sin against the Lord and to be baptized into Christ according to His commandment to have your sins washed away by His blood be added by Him to His church, and then from this day forward be His disciple, to grow and mature and be faithful to Him in following His will in your life and living with the sure hope of heaven, not simply a desire but an expectation of that blessed uh, home that He has provided and, and made available to His people. And so we hope you'll become a Christian tonight or correct sin as a child of God that uh, you might stand again in God's good favor and blessings uh, and uh, that sin removed by the blood of Christ as you confess it to him he's faithful and he's just to forgive that sin so we can assist you toward that end we simply we certainly want to uh, to encourage that and we're here to help you uh, this evening as we began this morning a study of some of the uh, material that we teach regularly in the uh, preacher training classes that that um, I'm able to conduct and teach in India. Uh, we talked our first hour in the class period about the trip itself, this past trip in January and February, and, and started looking at some of these the material that we're teaching in uh, the basics class, which is the first of a two-year program uh, to, the, uh, to the preachers that we arranged to come and be with us for a week at a time, uh, typically, and uh, to use that time to intensively study together from God's Word. Their background is in uh, institutional churches of Christ, and so uh, we spend uh, much time, as we talked about this morning, concerning Bible authority and studying the silence of the Scriptures. Uh, we spend time on understanding the distinction between the individual and the local church, something that's convoluted in the, the minds and practice of many in institutional churches of Christ, and we ended this morning by reviewing a lesson that we teach concerning the attitudes of spiritual liberalism. A uh, brother uh, correctly pointed out that we need to, to make it clear when we're teaching about such things, we're talking about attitudes that find their application in spiritual things, uh, and, uh, and uh, the same concept and principle can be found in other things, but we're talking about an attitude toward God's Word that essentially becomes broad-minded and, uh, and, and unrestrained and uh, developing an attitude in practice that essentially suggests it's no big deal to do many things uh, without or to go beyond what the Bible says. And so we lay that groundwork in the first couple of days uh, about two and a half days of our, our classes. Uh, and then we address uh, these other lessons that we have highlighted on this chart uh, and uh, spend a good deal of time uh, in getting to specific subject matter to help uh, identify what 
liberalism is. I mean, it's one thing to say, oh, I'm against liberalism uh, in the church. But do you understand and know what that means? What, what is that idea, that concept, and how does that practically look? And so, so we have a lesson, uh, developed a lesson that I entitled Defending the Indefensible as it addresses answering some of the errors that are found in uh, churches of Christ, the liberalism that's found in churches of Christ. And, and um, I spend a little bit of time in the first of that study talking about the so-called new hermeneutic. Now, that's a big word, and I explained that to the Indians. That just means how you study something, how you, how you interpret something, uh, and, uh, and how we view the Bible. And, of course, it's not so new now. At one time it was called new. Uh, but it has uh, shaped and changed the way many Christians and many in churches of Christ view and apply the Bible and its authority uh, in, in our lives and in the, the works of the local church. So we review again with our students, with the preachers, Bible authority. Again, remember this morning we, we pointed out on a chart that one of the objections given to Bible authority and, and commandments and examples and necessary inferences is that, well, that's just a man-made system, that that's just Church of Christ tradition. We vehemently deny that. Acts, the 15th chapter, affirms that it is entirely from God, approved by God, as the apostles and prophets in Jerusalem uh, affirmed the same and used the same to demonstrate the truth of the gospel was, uh, was not to apply... Uh, the law of Moses to those Gentiles who are being saved in Christ. And so to demonstrate that, that to do so is error, they used examples of their teaching, they drew inferences necessarily from what they were, uh, from God's presence and approval of their teaching and from direct statements of Scripture. So again, we reiterate that uh, as we go through this particular study and contrast it with uh, what has uh, been particularly voiced, uh, oh, the, this book, The Second Incarnation, came out, I believe, in the early 1990s, which uh, is, is farther, farther uh, longer ago than I like to admit. But, but um, Rubel Shelley and Sant Randall Harris wrote this book, The Second Incarnation, and they said there's no infallible method for interpreting Scripture. There is no heaven-given system of Bible study. Now, this is the attitude and the, the philosophy and the teaching that was brought to India and, and uh, propagated through, through decades of teaching is that, that uh, there's not a pattern uh, in certain matters that, that to, to talk about following a pattern, it becomes patternism, patternism and legalism and Phariseeism and all of these isms that, oh, we don't want to be a part of. But I lay the groundwork and we try to teach these brethren that uh, where this mindset came from and, and Harris and Shelley in their book lay it out pretty clearly. Now we have another generation like John Mark Hicks in his book Searching for the Pattern and other things like that who are, who have, uh, are springboarding off of some of these things uh, and influencing uh, not just institutional brethren but brethren in conservative churches of Christ that that following a pattern and, uh, and commands, examples, and inferences necessarily drawn, or that's just, again, we hear, the, we hear the same thing. That's just church tradition. That's just man-made. No, it's not. It's just the same old error being respun a generation later. And these men wrote this point. They say, we reject a, a rigid pattern theology that simply proposes to transplant religious cultural forms from the Bible to the 20th or 21st century. Well, we're not interested in, in transplanting re, uh, cultural forms. We're interested in abiding in the doctrine of Christ. We're in, and so that's a, that's a uh, uh, prejudicial way of describing the, the, the truth of the matter. But nevertheless, they say our hermeneutic, the way we're going to interpret Scripture is theological and Christocentric. Christ is going to be at the center of it. Now, that sounds good, doesn't it? We're going to put Christ at the middle of everything. Problem is, uh, in saying they're going to put Christ in the center of things, they forget Christ's word, as if you can separate Christ from his word and, and somehow keep Christ at the center. 
Because after all, we feel it. We feel Jesus, don't we? You know, we, 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 we have that emotional bond with Jesus. So it's got to be right. Or so it's claimed. Well, look at, look at what Shelley and Aunt Rubel Shelley and, and Harris said now 30 plus years ago. They said this principle has broad consequences for ecle ecclesiology, for the church, things concerning the church. It says, for example, that the church need not have either explicit mandate or permission for everything it wishes to do. The church may confidently ground its activities of compassion and service in the character of its head. Now all we have to do is just see the character of Jesus and that's enough authority for the church to do whatever it wants to do. So if the church wants to have a, a soup kitchen, if the soup, uh, church wants to have a medical mission out of compassion like Jesus, because he was a compassionate uh, Savior, then, then that's all the authority you need. It's just find the character of Christ in what you're going to decide to do as a church. and You don't have to have explicit mandate or permission, they said. And... The result of that, invariably, and there's other quotes. I'm, I've condensed this. There's a lot, a lot more we could say about this. But the result of that kind of thinking, this new hermeneutic, which now is showing itself again in a new way, but the same old error, is going to mean there will be fewer attempts to try to defend what is taught and practiced by finding Bible patterns by finding Bible authority. Remember Paul warned that the time would come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but having itching ears will heed to themselves teachers after their own lusts, and will turn away their ears from the truth and turn aside to fables. And so the warning in the first century is the same warning in the 21st century, is that you will always find someone who will teach what you want to hear, but that we are to hold fast to the pattern of sound words, because when we move away from God's revealed patterns to a, an idealistic, Christocentric, decide for yourself what Jesus would do and therefore you can do it, we've developed our own, our own traditions rather than following the traditions of the apostles. The silence of the scriptures will increasingly be used to give permission we studied that and discussed that a bit this morning. And when we approach this lax view of using the Bible for our authority, inevitably ecumenism will grow. Unity and doctrinal and moral diversity. Because after all, there's some things that just aren't clear. And so there's some gray areas, don't you know? And, 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 and so we're going to have to just give, give allowance for that. No, when God has given revelation, when God reveals His will on a matter, while it might be hard to understand, it's not impossible to understand. And God tells us to grow in our knowledge, in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. In that very passage when He said there's some things hard to understand, He said grow in knowledge. So we conclude we can know through a diligent study of God's Word. But you see... When we turn away from Bible patterns and we support unity and doctrinal diversity out of sincerity and goodness of the one who's teaching, then the word's no longer the pattern. We've, we've injected something and we've replaced it with other standards, standards of men. And so we, we work very hard to try to establish that groundwork in these classes in India, lessons that we need here surely to be teaching and understanding ourselves. Because you see, institutional liberalism, when we talk about liberalism from that point of view in Churches of Christ, says there's no binding patterns. Uh, Robert, uh, or I'm sorry, Jackie Steersman uh, wrote, the Bible does not provide an exclusive pattern for evangelism. Uh, and, and on that basis, then the church Church, many churches of Christ have what they call medical missions or education missions. Well, they'll, they'll send out a, mission, a, a medical team and that'll be their, their opening into a commu community to start teaching the gospel. Or, or they'll set up uh, 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 some kind of educational class. They'll, they'll, they'll teach English 
to a foreign language student using the Bible as a textbook. And so that becomes their opening door. You know, I, I don't read of any medical missions for Paul uh, and Luke. I don't, I don't read about Dr. Luke setting up a medical mission as being the avenue by which they started teaching the loss of the gospel. Do you? Well, maybe that silence just means we can go ahead and do it anyway. No. The call of the gospel is the pattern to follow in calling people to Christ. But, but what about the church's work in evangelism? That's what he was talking about. So we study that in India with these preachers. How... What is the, what is the, the, the pattern uh, of, in the New Testament for churches to work, to cooperate in evangelism? You know, the, the charge many decades ago was made that, that we're anti. We're anti-cooperation of churches. The truth is we're not anti-cooperation, we're anti-unscriptural cooperation of churches. But in the New Testament, as we have on the chart, we, there's a definite pattern of how churches cooperated in the work of evangelism. It's concurrent cooperation, not centralized cooperation. We have independent congregations under the oversight of their own elders who decide that they will send a preacher or they will support a preacher to preach the gospel. In Acts the 13th chapter, the church in Antioch, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, set aside Paul and Barnabas to the work of going into the Gentile regions and preaching the gospel, and they sent them out. In Philippians, the fourth chapter, the church in Philippi supported Paul when he uh, was in Thessalonica and then when he left Macedonia and now when he's in Rome, they again send support to him. The pattern over and over is the church sending directly to the preacher to support his needs, supply his needs for him to preach the gospel. In 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 8, Paul said, I robbed other churches taking wages from them to do service to you. So again, here are, are a number of churches supplying support to one man. Again, doing the same work, independent of each other, at the same time, that's concurrent action. That's how churches cooperated in evangelism in the New Testament. What we don't find in the New Testament is the institutional or centralizing of the authority of oversight in evangelism. No, you see, the Missionary Society back in the mid-19th century uh, urged churches to send money to the Missionary Society, and they would uh, collect those funds, and they would then oversee the sending uh, of those funds to preachers in different places in the world to preach the gospel. So you have now this centralized agency, this organization uh, to... Uh, to uh, that, that, uh, working th that the church has worked through to send preachers. Of course, there's no Bible for that. There's no scripture that authorizes that. And, and the irony is that a hundred years later, brethren who opposed the missionary society said, well, we can't set up a separate organization to do that, but what we'll do is set up a sponsoring church to practically do the same thing. The sponsoring church will, will take funds from independent churches and, and then we'll send out the preachers and, and we're going to oversee the work in Germany and we're going to oversee the work in India. Brethren, understand, please, you don't oversee any work in India. You support gospel preachers to preach the gospel in India. Elders oversee this work. You see, we need to be careful we don't... We don't facilitate or receive and use denominational terminology and thinking when we talk about such matters. No, you don't oversee any work in India. If you do, I want to urge you to repent because that's not your task. You're over, you oversee this work, elders, right? You, you don't oversee a different, another work. But you support preachers in India who do their work of preaching the gospel. You see, institutionalism has put this other step in here, the centralization step of now sponsoring churches and, and, uh, church and, and directors in India. One of the problems there is that churches of Christ in America send money to directors in India who then distribute money to the preachers and tell the preacher, you preach here, you preach there, and so forth. 
And so they've corrupted the simple pattern of how churches cooperate, churches supporting, sending support directly to a preacher to preach, and <clears throat> by doing that have engulfed many, many churches into uns in, un in unscriptural uh, practices concerning uh, how to receive and, and uh, use the funds uh, collected from churches to preach the gospel. So we spend time going into that. We also then talk about God's pattern for benevolence in churches. And what's more, it's not that we're against cooperation, but <clears throat> we are for the proper kind of cooperation of churches in benevolence. And what's more, it's concurrent action. That is, independent churches doing the same work at the same time to accomplish that work of helping needy saints not only locally, but then in other places particularly. And so we have many of the scriptures there on the chart that show God's pattern of, in Acts 11, we have one church, the church in Antioch, sending relief to a number of churches in Judea concerning the famine of the day. There was not, uh, there's nothing mentioned there about general benevolence, but to relieve brethren. And that, again, is a part of the pattern as well. Of course, in 1 Corinthians 16, along with 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 and Romans 15, we have, we have many Gentile congregations, independent of one another, determining to send relief to their brethren in Jerusalem. And so those monies were being collected, and they were sending their messengers along with Paul so that that money would then be given to the needy brethren to the local church in Jerusalem to help those needy saints. Again, the pattern in benevolence of how churches cooperated, doing the same work at the same time, yet independent of one another, accomplishing what each congregation was able to do. What we don't find in benevolence is the sponsoring church or institutionalizing of that work. Again, the centralization of it, whether it be in an orphanage or uh, an old folks home or some other institution established by men to receive funds from the church to then send to the need. No, in the Bible the money was sent directly to the need even as in the evangelism it was sent directly to the preacher. In benevolence it was sent directly to uh, that place, that congregation where the need existed. Again, liberalism says there's no binding pattern of what work the local church should do. So we spend time studying about the work of the local church. Um, Robert Turner had a written discussion with a man named Cogdell. Uh, and Cogdell in his, uh, in his writing said, Whatever love for God and man dictates is the law of God for the church. Whatever, whatever love dictates. Now, I guess he forgot that Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, which means love is going to be directed by what God's word says so that we can keep the command of God and thus show our love for Jesus Christ. And he just broadly says, whatever love dictates, uh, that, that's all you need to do some work as a local church. So we, that's what liberalism says. No binding pattern, yet again, clearly in the New Testament, we study this with the brethren there in India, that the work of the local church is to preach the gospel, to sound forth God's word to the lost. Acts 11th chapter, when the church in Jerusalem heard about the conversions in Antioch, they sent Barnabas uh, to encourage the brethren and to help continue the spread of the gospel. The work of a local church is to edify, build up the saints in the most holy faith. In Acts the 20th chapter, the elders were commended to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up. What builds up? Christians, fun, food, and frolic, have a party, get built up. No, worship builds us up, spiritual work together builds us up, learning the word of God builds us up, it strengthens our faith. You see, we go to the right source, we build each other up in the faith with the word of God. 1 Corinthians 14, 26 says, what shall I say then when you come together as a church? He says, each one has a psalm, has a has a prophecy, you have these miraculous spiritual gifts, uh, you have a psalm, you have a teaching, you have a tongue, a revelation, interpretation. 
Let all things be done for edification. When we come together like this, we're here doing the work of edification as we worship God, as we honor Him in song and petition Him in prayer and remember Him in the supper. When we give as we've been prospered and hear His word, we're building up, we're feeding the saints, building up the saints. That's how God has arranged the work of the local church. That's the edifying work to be done. We talk about the relief of needy Christians. Certainly that's a part of the work of the local church. And without exception, the pattern in Scripture is always a local church relieving needy Christians, whether among themselves or in other places. And in fact, remember, 1 Timothy 5.16 said there's even some needy Christians were not to be put on an ongoing role for that. If there's a family that has widows, that's where the first responsibility is to lie so the church can take the care of those who are really widows, those who qualify to be continually enrolled in care. So preaching the gospel, edifying the saints, relief of needy saints, this is the work of the local church. And the brethren, brethren we need to realize that God has arranged the local church to be sufficient. You see, under the oversight of qualified elders, deacons who serve, and every member doing their part, you see, God has arranged the church, the local church, to be fully equipped to do the work God wants it to do. It's only the human wisdom of men that says, well, we can't do that work by ourselves. We need to, we need to be a collective. We need to centralize ourselves. No, that's the wisdom and will of men, not the will of God. And so we spend, we spend a great deal of time on this particular lesson with the preachers there in India. We follow it with a lesson about fellowship and unity. And uh, we spend uh, some time in 1 John, the first chapter, verses 1 through 7, as the Apostle John makes it clear that the apostolic teaching becomes the foundation by which we not only have fellowship with them, but in having fellowship with them, we have fellowship with the Father and the Son, 1 John 1, verses 3 and 4. And then he goes on to explain that God is light and in Him is no darkness, so that if we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. That if we walk in the light, we... As he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. We have fellowship with God, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And so, Scripture teaches us it is the practicing of the truth revealed through the apostles that enables us to be in the light, as God is in the light, and to have fellowship with him. We, we spend time on that. We spend time on 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 16. We had it read. We read together earlier uh, about some of the facts of fellowship are reiterated here in these words. That uh, these five different terms in that verse that talk about fellowship. As we are not to unequally yoke ourselves with unbelievers. We are not to, uh, it, just as foolish as it would be to yoke an ox and a donkey. We are not to, as Christians, put ourselves in any relationship that by which we are controlled and drawn away from Christ and His will. And, so, and he has the rhetorical questions uh, with the clear answer no to each of them or none to each of them. There is no fellowship between righteousness and lawlessness. There is no communion, nothing in common between light and darkness. There is no harmony or accord with, between Christ and the worthless one, Belial, the devil. There is... No part that a believer has or portion a believer has with an unbeliever. There is no agreement with the temple of God and idols. You see, put that in chart form. He says that if there's any overlapping of those, that's sin. There's not to be any fellowship, any sharing together, anything in common, any harmony with the people of God and those who follow the God of this world so that the fact the Bible says have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness but rather even reprove them and so we talk about now see we're, bl we're blending these realities with our previous study about the work 
and organization of the New Testament church, of the local church. If we're acting in things with, for which we have no authority, we're sinning against Christ. And if we join with those who are, then we're sinning against God. We're not in fellowship with God. We're drawing the point that a decision has to be made. Am I going to be in fellowship with Christ and follow His patterns for the church? Or am I going to be in fellowship with those who sin against His word and pattern for the church? We talked at length about the basis of our fellowship is the truth of God and our obedience to it. That's what John repeatedly teaches. In First and Second John, as well as in the Gospel of John, we must first be in fellowship with God. You and I can share together and have, have agreement and participate together, but if we're not first in fellowship with God, it's worthless. It means nothing. And so let us first be sure that we know God. You know, John said, by this we know that we know God if we keep His commandments. That's the way I know God. I might feel something in my heart, but that's not how I know God. I know God if I'm loving Him enough to keep His commandments, if I'm doing His will. That's where our fellowship is. Jesus said, if a man loves me, he'll keep my word. John 14, 23. If a man loves me, he'll keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our home with him. So I talked to the brethren, the preachers there. I usually do it much earlier in, in these series than this, but, but I just now thought about it, so I'm going to tell you what it is. I, I talked to them about draw a circle around yourself. You're sitting here. You're sitting in your chair now studying this. Draw a circle around, and the Bible says whoever goes beyond and, and, and transgresses and goes beyond the doctrine of Christ doesn't have God. If you're in that circle, you're abiding with Christ. You're following His Word. You're practicing His truth. But if you step beyond it, what have you done? Now you've acted on your own will. What does John say? He says, now I don't have fellowship with God. See that? It's, it's not too hard to understand. It's just that we need to have the faith to apply it. And by the way, he says, if someone comes to you and he doesn't teach this doctrine, he doesn't teach the doctrine of Christ, he said, don't receive him to your house or give him a greeting. Don't you endorse him. Don't you encourage him. Don't you be a helper with him. Don't be unequally yoked. You don't have a part in that. Because if you do, he says, then you do have a part. Then you become a partaker in his evil deeds. You have fellowship in his evil deeds, 2 John 11. Isn't it curious there that false doctrine is called an evil deed? You get that? Some people think, that, that, that we forget that, that teaching error is evil. It's sin. It destroys souls because it takes them away from truth. So we talk about that at length with the preachers in India to emphasize our fellowship must be with those who teach the truth and practice the truth and endorse the truth. And we supply scripture and we go through all these scriptures with them. That on the other hand, we are not to have fellowship. That should say no fellowship on that side. No fellowship with those who teach error, practice error, or endorse error. No fellowship there. And if we do, then we lose our fellowship with God. And that's an extremely serious thing. So the scripture says, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. And I'll receive you. We want to be received by the Lord. So we've got to come out away from those things that are not in fellowship with His truth, in harmony with His will and in fellowship with Him. I spend a whole lesson on respect of persons because the, the Hindu culture for 3,000 years has lived the caste system that says depending on where you're born, then, then that determines your lot in life. And the Hindu concept of reincarnation is you must accept the station in which you're born and be the best person you can be in that and, and, and then maybe in the next life you'll progress farther. But the result of the caste system is a lot of prejudice. You know, I'm higher than you. <laughs> you know. And most of the people that we work with are in the, the low caste, the untouchable caste. And... Uh, and yet there's, there's squabbling among them because there's 
castes and subcastes. So we spend some time on talking about not respecting or not being partial, not showing partiality. We study James 2, as we have on the chart there, and we go through these entire points that, that, uh, that the Holy Spirit taught, that we simply cannot hold the faith of Jesus Christ with partiality. Faith is not determined by, by the color, by the pigment of our skin. It's not determined by uh, the origin of our birth, what country we were, we were born in. No, don't be a respecter of persons. And we, we spend a good deal of time on that uh, with the brethren. I, want, I told you this morning we talk about Jesus, the Son of God, just a little bit. And we have this study as well. Uh, that, that, uh, and I mentioned to you this morning that, that the truth that of the Godhead has been uh, perverted somewhat by some teaching and some brethren have been troubled by it some. And so we looked at this this morning that, that uh, Jesus is indeed eternal God, that Jehovah includes the Godhead, Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Uh, but we went, we've, we went a little bit deeper into that with a particular study. Uh, was Jesus the Son of God on earth? Of course, Jesus claimed to be the Son of God on earth. He called God his Father. Those who heard him say that understood that he made himself equal with God and they tried to kill him for it, tried to stone him and called him a blasphemer because of this. And, and yet in John the fifth chapter he goes on to show the equality of himself and the Father and doing the same work, having the same judgment, same honor, same life and the same authority. And, and we study that some and of course the idea of son of expresses that he had the same nature as his father, just like a son of peace has a peaceful quality or nature, the son of God speaks to his deity, that he is in fact God. Well, they, the question says, well, what does it mean then the father is greater than the son if Jesus is equal with God? Well, of course, it talks about Jesus in his flesh in submitting to the will of the father in John 14, 28, when he said the father is greater than I because Jesus as a servant here on earth submitted himself to the Father's will and so uh, in that sense uh, of submission that could be said. One of the corollaries of this error developed this idea, well, should we worship Jesus or not? And so we talked some to them about the fact that Jesus was in fact worshipped on earth time and time again and that he never rejected that worship. Well, and yet, righteous men and angels refused worship. Peter did, Paul and Barnabas did in Acts 14. The angel refused John's worship in Revelation 22. Now, Jesus was a righteous man without sin. 2 Peter 2, 2. Well, why didn't he refuse worship? Well, the reason is because he was, he, he was deity. Yes, he was man. He's fully man, but he's fully God. He deserved it. He never resisted it. He never refused it because, of course, he was God with us. And so we emphasized that and talked about that in, in a great detail. But one, one final point here as we close, and that is I spend time talking to the preachers about preaching. You know, preaching needs to be understood for the work that is revealed in Scripture for what it is and not allow the, the uh, uh, desires and dictates of men to decide and determine what it means to preach. Do you know why you preach? Do you know why you preach what you preach? Uh, in 1 Timothy 1, verses 5, 6, and 7, it says, The purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith from which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm or they confidently assert. He said there are people who are teaching things and they make it sound like they're confident in what they're saying. They firmly believe what they're saying. He says they couldn't be more wrong. They desire to be teachers, but they don't understand what they're saying. If that was true in the first century, it's still true in the 21st century. And that as gospel preachers, we need not only to know why we preach, we need to know why we preach what we preach. You know, preaching is not just about standing up here and talking for 30 minutes or 45 minutes. I know, I've gone longer than 30. 
It's not about just standing up and filling some time. It's, it's about filling your time with God's Word. It's about proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul said, I charge you in the sight of God to preach the Word. There's a charge given to the gospel preacher. And so we teach and speak to these men in India and in, whenever I have a chance to speak to gospel preachers. Know what you preach. And if you're not preaching God's Word, sit down. We don't need to listen to you. I don't need to know what you've experienced and what you feel. I need to know what the Bible says so that I can build my faith in it. I don't need my faith built in you, Mr. Preacher. Of course, then there's, a, there's the poem that says, Preach a sermon, preacher. Preach it round or flat. We love at guessing where you're at, you know. We can preach some things and we can, we can, as long as we preach it general... They think we're terrific, but don't get specific, you know. And too often, preachers yield to the temptation to preach in a way that, oh, he's a great preacher, but do we speak to what needs to be said? What did he say in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 4? He said, preach the word, be urgent, in season and out of season. One old time preacher said that means preach it when they like it and preach it when they don't. Preach it, preach what needs to be preached. He said, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Because the time will come, they won't endure sound doctrine. So I talked to the preachers about preaching what needs to be preached and living what you preach. Timothy was to be an example to the believers, 1 Timothy 4 and verse 12. A man of God was to be practicing his teaching and not quarrel but be gentle to all able to teach and patient in humility correcting those who are in opposition so I talked to the preachers about what it means to preach and what are you preaching we talked we made the specific we talked at length about some of these specifics that we've gone through here tonight in brief that really make up these series of lessons because only as preachers are grounded in the Word of God will they be able, then be able to teach that Word to others. Proverbs 23 and verse 23 says, Buy the truth and sell it not. Yea, wisdom and understanding and knowledge. Seize, acquire truth and don't let it go. Jeremiah 6 and 16 said, Stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk therein. The old paths are the sound ways revealed in Jesus Christ. The sound words of Christ, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 3. Teach the sound doctrine as Paul exhorted Titus in Titus 2 uh, and verse 1. Preach the things that amount to sound doctrine. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a brief summary of the, the sessions with the Indian preachers the first year. Then they come back for more the second. Because you see, we need to make it very clear that not all churches of Christ in India are the same. They're not all the same here. We must hold fast the pattern that God has revealed to us in Scripture. That we must build our faith on it, on His Word. That's where we find the love of God. That's where we find the grace of God. That's where we find fellowship with God. And may that be true for each soul here tonight. And for this congregation as you adhere to God's pattern and proclaim His Word and live it in your lives. That God will bless you. And may he bless you for the work that you're doing in, in, in India uh, as you help support faithful men who will then be able to teach others also. If you're not a Christian, we hope you'll obey the gospel tonight in faith to repent, to confess that Jesus is the Son of God and be baptized into Christ is your most urgent need. All is prepared that you might be saved in Christ if you respond to his call. All together we stand and sing. Won't you come?